if they are being insulting on a personal level, my support doesn't go diminished. I'm here to do a job. I will do it to the best of my ability in all situations. Sound design. Live. Welcome to Sound Design Live. I'm Nathan Lively, and this is a special episode of the Sound Design Live podcast. Now, back in June, I produced an event called Live Sound Summit. This event brought together some of my favorite teachers in the world of live audio. One of those teachers is Alice Stefancic, and he led a workshop called Gorilla Mixing. Gorilla Mixing is all about getting the best results under the worst circumstances. So I think at the end of the day, we all know that we could probably handle any problem as long as we had enough time and the right resources. But that never happens, does it? We always have too little time and not quite the right resources to get the job done. So in this workshop, Alice shares some great tips that he's uncovered over the years of working on a lot of these kinds of shows. And I'm not going to play the whole workshop for you here, but what I've done is edited together some of my favorite parts. If you want to watch the whole workshop, that's available over on sounddesignlive.com. But for now, please enjoy these highlights from Gorilla Mixing. Sound Design. So what is Gorilla Mixing or the term that I have sort of um, coined for this presentation? Uh, it's what I call mixing against all odds. You have no time for advanced preparation. You are lacking all relevant information. The environment, which is like an ultimate test for your speed, your focus, and your mixing ability. And it's not that uncommon. I'm pretty sure that you have been faced with this scenario of you know things not going your way, and it happens more than you think. Uh, we all strive to do shows that are well thought out in advance, um, that have a lot of pre-production periods where you can really hone in your craft and make sure everything is working, maybe set up so, like um, cues, scenes, snapshots, whatever you want to call them, uh, stuff that will really help the act shine in the best possible way. You have specified the riders or have gotten the riders and the riders are working fine, but these are not the situations most of the time. Um, I do a lot of mixing of bands at festivals. Um, right now, I'm, I'm a part of a team that is working on a festival. And just yesterday, I was faced with a lot of misinformation, riders that weren't delivered either on time or were lacking in information. There's a lot of times doing those summer festivals where you have like three, four headliners, uh, and then you would have maybe a local band that has just won a contest to be a part of that festival. And then there you are, uh, a sound engineer that has to take care of that band. And of course, everybody else's sound check was running late, so they have no sound check, you have no writer, you have no input list, but you have to make it work for the next, let's say, 45 minutes. Or gear just sort of breaks down on you. Uh, you would have digital mixing consoles that would malfunction. And then maybe the settings that you have made were all lost uh, right before you were about to save your stuff on, the, on an external thumb drive. So right now you are faced with a blank slate, maybe 20 minutes into the sound check and you only have 10 minutes left. What do you do then, right? So these are quite common situations where uh, people have asked me how I approach this. Um, and the first thing I tell them, if, if you have the chance, try to prevent it from happening. Now, that, that this is where we are talking about like best case scenario where you still have some time to get relevant information for your particular situation. Maybe you have time to call the venue um, or the organizer in advance to get some information. Uh, YouTube is a great uh, resource on just about any band on planet Earth, which I use quite often. Even if I don't get any technical information from, from the organizer, there's probably like at least one, one video of, of the band playing somewhere, even if it's a local gig. It will give me an insight on the stage plot, on... I can guess fairly quickly how many channels they have, which instruments, instruments they're using. Maybe sometimes I can even see the, the monitoring specification 
um, whether they're using INEAS or they're using wedges and stuff like that. If nothing of all of these um, all of these scenarios works for you, or there's just no time, or there's any other circumstance uh, circumstances that are unforeseeable, then I advise to all of my fellow engineers to to sort of remember three key things um, when they are faced with mixing under extreme circumstances. And the first thing to remember uh, that I do all the time before you do anything, um, do this step of verification and console preparation. This step might get overlooked or might get skipped if you have, let's say, if, if you have been working with the, the system as a, uh, as a house engineer uh, for the rental company and you know that everything is set up correctly, you've been using the setup before on other bands, so that's fine, you have done your homework there, but let's say uh, you just get to the venue with, with the band and now there's a, a new console that you're not familiar with just run really quickly as the band sets up on stage through the tools that you will work with during mixing. So just make sure that my pan is set correctly so that the left side is on the left in the left speaker, the right side of my panning is in the right speaker. Make sure your front fills are working, make sure your subs are working. I'm not even not even talking about verifying whether or not these are in time or if they are aligned it's just really down to the nitty-gritty basics uh, of making sure that whatever you think should be set up correctly is in in fact set up correctly make sure that you check for the monitor lies so if somebody says well give me you know give me more vocals in this monitor that you know that that particular monitor is on aux number three and when you when you open aux number three it will go specifically to that monitor and not any other monitor uh, on, on stage the next thing that that is sort of a, a big one for me is uh, focusing on the stage in these situations like 90 percent of the time we are working front of house and monitoring from the same position and it's really easy to get sort of caught up in the moment and just uh, go, okay, now the band is going to start playing. And what I have to do is basically make sure that the sound for the audience is great. That's all fine and dandy. But in my head, what I need to do first is focus on the stage and make sure that the performers can hear themselves. If they can't do that, they can't play. If they can't play, there's no amount of EQing and compression and whatever I can do on the console that will make them sound good. So use line check for that initial gain setup. Um, if you have somebody running the vocal mics, just have the first one, you know, speak into sing into a, a vocal mic, get that gain, input gain ready to. Um, to the level that you want it to be, and then just quickly run through all of the other vocal mics and have that same gain structure uh, that will give you a starting point where you can sort of quickly set up all of the input gains. Um, and then make sure that the console is set um, to show you the metering uh, pre-fader so that you are making sure that you are really looking at the signal at the um, input stage, not at the output stage. Uh, so when you're adjusting the input gain, you can set all of those input gains quite quickly at a uniform level. And I've been asked a question quite a lot. What about uh, you know faders at zero mixing? Um, I would use faders at, faders at zero mixing if I am running front of house only. That would be a preferred strategy, at least in my preference. Whenever I'm using uh, the same console to work on front of house and on monitoring positions, then I would use the equal input gain um, strategy or approach. In my head, it just makes everything much more clear 
on the on the sense side of things, on the auxiliary side of things, when I'm setting up then for monitor mixer, the mixes for the performers on stage. And the third rule that I sort of teach or live by religiously is keeping it simple. When you have these situations where um, you really have to do a, a run and gun style of mixing, um, don't be fancy and don't be overly creative. It might be it might be prudent to reduce like the inputs to one source, one mic. So let's say if you have a drum kit, what I would usually do in a, in a situation where I would have more time to prepare, more time to mix, is to have a snare bottom and a snare top microphone. But when you are working under these constraint con conditions, thinking about phase and thinking about like the three to one rule, stuff like that, just throw it out the window, uh, simplify things as much as you can so you don't have to deal with so many channels and so many you know relationships between those microphones. Let's take some questions now, and then I'll return to one of my previous slides. Nathan, do you have anything for me? Peter says, do you think that everyone can learn how to mix well, or do you think there's an inherent baseline of talent required for live engineering? I think that the technical side of mixing can be absolutely learned and absolutely taught. The key aspect to just about every good mixer is also their own personality being supportive, being humble, being very professional at what you do. These are the things that, you know, I can't teach you. I can teach you about um, my approach and, and, and my, my take on what is going on in the mixing world. But it will take, you know, a combination of your dedication. It will take a combination of your personality. Um, and also, um, Sometimes it's much easier for people from musical backgrounds just because they already have some ear training because they have played an instrument. It's also good to know music theory. Uh, it's also good to know, you know, everything about music. If you are in the, in the music business, it's good to know about technical sides of video if you are doing broadcast. But these are all things that can be taught and learned through time. So... Yeah, I, I would guess that most of the people um, could learn mixing. That's good news for me. Okay, <laughs> Pablo asks, uh, why split, why slash split channels for vocals um, to do front of house monitors, question mark? Not in these types of situations. What goes on the, at the front of house will also go to the, to the monitors. Just in terms of reducing the number of channels that I have to work with to get quick results. Yeah, um, you're trying to reduce complexity, right? Absolutely. So just simplify it, keep it simple. But if, if you're not faced with these, um, with these constraints, then absolutely, um, I really support that. Um, just having one channel dedicated to, to the monitors and one channel dedicated for front of house, especially for vocals. Um, and maybe some other key uh, channels of the of the performance is very beneficial. Yes. Peter says, um, "What advice would you have for working with a band that is being difficult, hmm. particularly in a situation <clears throat> wherein it is a one of situation where you won't be able to build a lasting and a, and it cuts off there." But I assume he was going to write lasting relationship. Yeah. You cannot influence the way other people treat you, and you cannot help if somebody is being like a, a shithead. Um, but you can absolutely influence the way you treat them and the way um, you approach these sort of people. Being professional also means sometimes that you have to work with people that are unagreeable. In those situations, I try to remind myself of a couple of things. First of all, if I'm working for, for, for a band, even if I'm hired by the rental company or whoever, I'm here to support that act. So if it is in my power to accommodate 
whatever they want to have, I'll, I'll go out of my way to do that. Um, if they are being insulting on a personal level, my support doesn't go diminished. I'm here to do a job. I will do it to the best of my ability in all situations. What, what goes around comes around. You know, if, if you are rude to a lot of people as a sound engineer, then people will stop, stop working with you. If you are rude as a performer to everybody, not just technicians, but that usually translates to being rude to, to promoters and organizers. And um, that will also come around and bite you up your ear end. So, you know, do your work and let karma do it. So <laughs> that's my advice for you. All right. Um, Pablo says, do you ever tune the front of house PA quickly with the vocal mic you will be using? What's your process for getting that done fast? Um, I've seen that done, but I, I, don't, I don't do that. If I do have time to sort of tune the, the system with a vocal mic, I absolutely have time to run a pink noise through my measurement system. And that will give me much more information than running something through, through my vocal mic. Um, especially if it's a, a band that maybe it's a heavy rock and roll band and stuff like that, and using a lot of low end, I will not get any information from, from, from the vocal mic in that situation. Peter says, is there an appropriate way of telling an engineer that their mix just isn't right, be it too loud, tonally way out of whack, et cetera? So potentially mm. complicated situation there. We don't really know all the players. Yeah. Here. Maybe you can imagine it. Have you been in a situation like that where you <laughs> need to tell another engineer that their mix isn't right? Um, I have, but I never do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, Bob McCarthy at the beginning of today's live summit had a really great line saying uh, some of some of the audio stuff is objective. Some of the audio stuff is really subjective. The mixing part comes in on heavily on the subjective side. What for you sounds out of whack may be, may be um, just exactly what the band envisioned as their sound. Um, so who am I to go up to an engineer and say, well, you know, you're shit. Um, I, might come up, I might come up to them if I'm, let's say, working with the PA rental company and I see that he's having trouble in, in terms of there's feedback or um, like there's, um, like there's other stuff, like noises, stuff coming from, from the PA. Um, and we'll try, I'll just offer my help in terms of locating the issue, but I will never step in onto somebody else's mix. Never. That's not my, that's not my job to do. My job, um, as a, as a mixing engineer is to mix to the best of my abilities. Plus I might not have all the relevant information. Um, his mix might be out of whack because that bloody bass player just won't turn down his amp. Um, and there's nothing that he can do in this situation. So even if I come up to him, there might not be anything that he could do. Um, and, you know, everybody has a learning curve. So I'm, I might offer my help, but I would never go up to them and say, this just doesn't sound right. Christopher says more and more bands are showing up with IEMs mm -hmm. without prior notice. Oh, so right. Ask, you know, what is the gorilla mm -hmm. mixing response to this? So in a scenario where a drummer shows up and springs IEMs on you, how do you mm -hmm. oblige? Do you add ambient mics? Do you use their monitor wedge mix and just use a Y cable to split it? Or do you give them their own IEM mix and get tied up throwing on headphones, feeding that mix? IEMs without prior notice are not usually that big of a deal for me. If I have enough auxiliary sends on the console, then great. That means one less wedge on stage, which basically translates into a quieter stage, will, will inevitably help me mix better because I don't have to deal with you know that booming kick from, from behind the drums. 
And so setting up the IM the IEM um, mix is for me quite easy if I'm using like a Senzon fader. Um, I would just set up uh, if I can a stereo um, a stereo mix for them because IEMs and mono are just crap. And then if if I can set up a stereo mix for them, um, then it doesn't differentiate very much from what I'm doing in front of house you know, thinking in terms of their monitors. Um, so I would set up a baseline, uh, a sort of a, a volume baseline with them. So let's say um, if it's drummer, then they would usually have to have a lot of kick and snare and, and, their, and their own drums into their mix. So what I would basically do is start with the kick and say, is it loud enough, loud enough, loud enough? And when they say, okay, then I have my baseline. So this is the kick, it's usually the loudest the loudest part of their mix and everything just has to be sort of down below um, in there. Um, so you can really set up their mix quite quickly. Um, and once you do that, you're basically trouble free for the, for the rest of the evening because you have no bleed, you have zero chance of feedback. Um, so IEMs are basically welcome, not feared um, when I do these types of situations. Um, Alish, what is the uh, gorilla mixing approach to ringing out monitors? So Christopher says, please discuss your preferred method for ringing out monitors, parametric EQ, mm. graphic EQ, feedback suppressor, gating. Now, you have to realize that you have just entered the world of Nathan Lively. So just saying the words graphic <laughs> EQ might get you banned from this live summit. No, I'm just joking around. Um, no, I already kicked him out. He's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, ringing out monitors quickly. If I get if I get the chance of of doing that, is basically I would set up the vocal mic on, on its position, so that height where I would maybe have it turn directly to the position where the, the the main vocal will be standing, and then I would go behind the console and just gain it up and see which is the fundamental frequency that will sort of pop up that gets turned down with a parametric EQ, uh, and then the second one and the third one. In guerrilla mixing style, you usually don't have that preference. Um, so it basically just comes down to when you're doing monitors, the first thing that feed back, feeds back gets cut. Um, that's why uh, you should really train your ears with either sound gym or whatever you know, preferred method, but dialing in that frequency, um, listening to those frequencies will be a lifesaver for you. And there's one more thing why maybe, maybe having a measurement microphone up um, might benefit you. You know, sometimes those measurements will, will show a very distinct thin line, thin line when feedback happens. Um, if you're like running a, a spectral analysis, and it will just help you determine quickly, you know, what that frequency is if if it's if you're not sure where it is, and then that frequency will get cut from all of the monitors. I don't care if if it's just on that lead vocal, but I will go through all of the monitors and just turn that notch down, and that sort of gets repeated throughout the process, you know if it feeds back, if I don't have the time, if I have the time to ring out the monitors, then I will absolutely do that. Just set up a vocal mic, gain it, find the first frequency, turn it down, gain it some more, find the next frequency, gain it down. Do that for the first three or four frequencies and you will probably get between, in my experience, five to eight dB more uh, gain before feedback. Uh, so that's that's quite a bit. Um, if you have the chance to do that, absolutely do that. A uh, really helpful technique that I learned from you recently, Alish, was basically just how to link all graphic EQs on the Digico board. And I know we're not talking about Digico here, but um, it just made me realize that a really great technique when there's like a moment of sort of panic feedback on stage and you don't know where it's coming from, if you can have a place where you can quickly go to and uh, EQ all outputs, like you just said, like, I don't know where it is and I don't care, let, but I know it's around 1K mm -hmm. and I can sort of do a cut to like do anything except just muting all the inputs. 
Um, yeah, a, I mean, that's a really um, backup tool, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. But the feed, I mean, we could talk about feedback, uh, its origins and, and, you know, the weirdest places where feedback has occurred for like two more hours. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one thing that I sort of, uh, try to, to focus on is simply determining what is causing the feedback, because sometimes the answer might not be that obvious. Um, it's usually the vocal mic, you know, I want more me, more me, and then it gets cut because it's screeching in their monitors. But sometimes it's not that. It, it could be something completely different. Like if you have a roll, like a low rumbling noise coming through the stage, it could be a, like a floor tom or something if you're not using gates or stuff like that. So just make sure that you know or try to make an educated guess where the feedback is actually coming from. Um, once you once you have that piece of information, then you can go into um, then you can go and, and sort of try and, and, and fix that. Um, but yeah, realizing where it comes from will actually be like the number one priority you have to focus on. Alice, any um, any closing remarks? I'll just say that you can act, uh, actually um, train this, you know. Uh, with virtual sound check uh, capabilities, if you have uh, access to a mixing board and a multi-track, give yourself five minutes to like zero out the board, um, run the multi-track, and then time yourself and see how much time you get. You know, to basically set up a, a front of house mix in terms of setting the input gains, going it through levels. Um, knowing where your sends are. So stuff like that will really help you um, craft um, your speed and um, it will make you a better mixer. So you can absolutely um, go and train for that. If by any chance you have uh, any questions that you might have about mixing or my personal approach, um, check out my content at GameMediaLab.com and you can always email me at info at GameMediaLab.com. Sound design. Yeah.